gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things I have commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you always until the very end of the age. So what he's saying is, in other words, he won't leave you until the day you die. <laughs> until you give your last breath, the Lord will be with you. Now before I get into this message, I want to start off with something funny tonight. I heard about this woman who was trying to wake up her son to go to church one morning. He says, I ain't going to church. She says, well, why? He says, I'll give you two reasons why I will not go. One, they don't like me. And two, I don't like them. So the mother thought about it, and then she said, okay, I'm going to give you two reasons why you will go to church. Number one, you're 47 years old. (laughs) Number two, you're the pastor of the church. (laughs) So you got to go to church if you're the pastor, amen? Amen. Now before I get into this lesson, how many of you wonder, what is my plan that God has for me? Have you ever asked yourself that? What is the plan that the Lord has for me? Well, I learned from a recent message I heard from one of my teachers at school, who I'm proud to call my mentor, Mr. Ballard. He says, the reason why your plans or your expectations don't meet is because God is looking out for you. Amen? God is only looking out what is in your best interest. How many of you hear your parents say, well, we want to do what's best for our kids? Yes. Amen. Amen. All the time. Amen. You've heard, you've heard your parents say, oh, we want to do what's best for our kids. Yeah. That's like God with us. He wants to do what is best for us. And you're thinking, well, I don't know what my plan is. I don't know, I don't know if he, even the Lord has a plan. I'm going to tell you tonight that he does have a plan. You don't believe me? Check out Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. So we know right off the bat the Lord has a plan. So the next time you're thinking, well, I don't know what my plan is. I don't know what God's plan is for me. Just remember, he had a plan. You may not know what that plan is, but you know he's got your back. Now on to the text and now to the word. You ever read something and you're like, oh, this is so mind-blowing to me? You know, or, oh, I never thought of it that way before. This was the same thing. When John told me to give something from the Gospels, because we're in our series Red Letters, I was like, okay, I prayed and I thought about it. Now it's like, how about I preach on gratefulness? Now this message was done by a preacher down in Texas, and what he says as I was reading it was really mind-blowing. Because I was like, man, I never thought of it from that perspective before. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you read like Harry Potter or anything nerdy, you know... (laughs) You know, anything like that, you're just like, you're just like, oh my goodness, I'm blown away, you know? Sometimes that we read the Bible, I am so blown away. I've never thought of it like that. This is the same thing. First of all, what do you think gratitude means? In your own words, and don't use this word in its definition. Be gracious. Unacceptable definition. (laughs) But seriously, what do you think gratitude means? Like showing appreciation. Showing appreciation. Gratitude. Uh, I'll say, I hope that's not the definition. <laughs> gratitude. What do you think it is? Being thankful. Being thankful. And if there is one sin that was most prevalent today, or the sin that is most common, or the most widespread, is not being thankful. It's, being, it's having that ingratitude. It's having that sin of ingratitude. And God does so much for us, amen. God does so much that our indebtedness or the amount that we owe him is enormous. And yet we rarely, or at least infrequently, offer thanks for what he has done. You know what the fact is? The fact is is that most professing Christians don't even offer thanks over their meals, much less offer thanks over all that God has done. So you hear them say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for everything you've done in my life. But yet you won't hear them say, thank you for this meal that we're about to partake. We are much like the little boy who was given an orange by a man. 
So, so we got this kid, and we got this man. The man gives the kid an orange. And the mother say, well, what do you say to the nice man? What do we assume that he's going to say? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying it, but thank you. <laughs> but instead, he thought about it, handed the orange back and said, peel it. Didn't even say, sister. thank you. Or your sister. That's my sister. <laughs> Lord be with your sister. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Isn't that kind of like us, though? She says thank you. When, oh, well, that's good to know. <laughs> Isn't that like us, though? If someone offers us something, like if I, if somebody offers me this, okay? Yes, it is a half. Glad you guys already got one. <laughs> Go with me on this. If someone, if this hat was brand new, okay? If this hat was brand new and someone gave it to me, I'm gonna be like, thank you, and just wear it all the day long. I'm not gonna hand it back and say, "Go join Al Capone in Chicago," <laughs> because it's got that fedora type. You know? But for a child of God, thankfulness is not confined to a day or a season. And what's the one time of the year that we give thanks? Thanksgiving. 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 <laughs> it's not confined to a day or a season. It's not like, you know what, I'm going to thank God during Thanksgiving. Because that's about nationwide, that's about what we do. But really, but really it is an attitude that we should have every day and every hour. So just because you thank God on Thanksgiving doesn't mean you can thank God every other season. Just because you thank God on one day doesn't mean that you can thank Him every, every single day. Every day when you can get up, the time you go to bed, just take some time out of your day. It could be like five minutes, it could be, you know, however long you want to thank Him for. And just take some time to say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. To magnify this point, I want us to examine the account of the ten lepers in Luke 17. So if you got your Bibles, you can turn to Luke 17 if you want. Does anybody want a Bible? Bible? No. If anybody wants the Bible, go we'll see all of them. You know, another thing that my teacher says is, because at our school, we use iPads. We use our iPads for everything. Our textbooks, even our Bibles is on our iPads. And what he says, really, is going to stick with me. He says, it's always good to have a hard copy of the Bible because you don't need to charge it every single night. Luke 17, 11. We're going to start on verse 11. And if somebody wants to read 11 and 12, whoever's got it. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there he met ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Alright, so we see here two different kinds of positions that the lepers are in. Okay? We see the most awful position, and we see the approachable position. What does he mean by that? Luke says that they stood afar off. So the disease of the leprosy, because leprosy was this scaly, you get these scaly spots all over you, and it's extremely painful. You know, interesting fact, even though there are rare cases of leprosy today, you can still get it by making contact with an armadillo. Just saying. This is very rare, okay? It's very rare, but you can still get it. But the disease of, the disease of leprosy was painful, but the physical pain was not the first part. Well, hold on a minute there, Curtis. What are you trying to say? Are you trying to say that the painful thing was not the most painful thing? <laughs> that is what I'm trying to say. The worst thing was that they were separated. They were cast off. They were away from everybody else into a specific area. And it seems here that these lepers were shot out in an area away from everyone else. I want you to think about this. One of the things that they were separated from was their family. How would you feel if you couldn't go, go, go with your family anywhere? You'll feel, you'll feel sad, right? you feel depressed, maybe a little crazy at times. No one knows how long it's been since they felt the touch of their wife or the kiss of their children. They were shot from their friends. Basically, your whole social life is gone. How would you feel if you had no social life at all? 
crust. A lot of us would be like, I would, a lot of us would be like, I want to lay down and die because I have no social life. What if you don't have a life? Well, you got a life with Jesus. Remember that. Oh. Remember that. But think about it. Think about it. But think about it. Friends no longer invited you to go to places with them because of this disease that you have. So you can you can go with them. It's like, oh hey, I want to join you. Oh no, oh no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't want to join me because I don't I don't want to catch what you got. You know what I'm saying? There was shit out from the fellowship of the church. How would you feel if you couldn't interact what we're doing right now? How would you feel? Depressed. There was shit out from the fellowship of the church. Notice that Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, entered into a certain village and there met the ten lepers. Now, the religious, the religious crowds, I can't talk tonight, the re religious crowds. Like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had no room for these lepers' men. But you, know, but that's not the most awful thing. You're probably thinking, "You sir are crazy." He's first you say you were shut out from, they were shut out from their family. Then you say they were shut out from their friends. Now you're saying that they were shut out from the fellowship. What else is left? What else is left? Jesus. They were shut out from the Father. How would you feel if you were cut out from God? Think about that. Here is Jesus, the only way to the Father, as John 14, 6 proclaims, the only way to the Father, and yet they stand away from him because of what they have. Now notice, now remember that sinners are not near God. They're just afar off. And they cannot and will not draw near to him on their own. As it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1, it says that we shall run the race with endurance. But what thing, but what do you think kept them at a distance? Obviously, they're leprosy, but the law, the law, the law that was set forth, you know, those 629 or 619 laws that were there in the Old Testament. The law set forth the conduct. The law says when you pass somebody with leprosy, run to the other side and you're unclean, unclean to identify this person's contagious. To identify that this person is has some kind of disease. Okay? And there's no doubt in my mind that sin puts us in the most awful position. Amen? Remember when I talked about temptation? And, you know, when... When you give in to Satan and when you give in to the world after it, don't you feel so guilty? Don't you feel like you've been in the most awful position you've ever been in your life? But all these men were in the same position. Now the second kind of position were inapproachable. Here are these men living shut out lives, but I am grateful this evening that where the law says man can't go, Jesus goes. Where the law says, what the law declares off limits, Jesus barges in. When the law passes on the other side, Jesus makes a point to contact. Jesus came to save sinners. Amen. Amen. That's why he was here. But notice, he went this way on purpose. It's not like, oh, I accidentally came into this village. No, he wanted to go that way. He wanted to go into that place. I can imagine the disciples are like, um, what are you? Doing Jesus? Why are you going down this awful path? We're supposed to be going this way. He's like, well, I'm going to make a detour. Okay? Jesus is able to reach and save us. Now, I learned from John that our world is drowning in sin. And we as Christians are in this boat. We're in this boat. Everyone else is drowning in their sin. And we're not reaching. We're just sitting there. When someone comes and reaches and we grab them, we should, we should haul them in the boat. Otherwise, otherwise this world is going to drown in sin. It already is. And while he stands afar from him, he doesn't stand afar from us. 
When they could not get to Jesus, Jesus got to them. When they could not get to him, he came to them.